November 1970. James Baldwin wrote this letter to Angela Davis after seeing an image of her, a photograph of her covered on the, uh, pictured on the cover of Newsweek magazine. She had chains and handcuffs on her hands, and she's sort of standing like this, and this is what they had on the cover of the magazine, and he was so moved, even though he didn't have a previous relationship with her. He didn't know her, they weren't friends. He wrote her this letter, and he said, and I quote, Dear sister, one might have hoped that by this hour the very sight of chains on black flesh or the very sight of chains would be so intolerable a sight for the American people and so unbearable a memory that they would themselves spontaneously rise up and strike off the manacles. But no, they appear to glory in the chains now more than ever. They appear to measure their safety in chains and corpses and so Newsweek civilized defender of the indefensible attempts to drown you in a sea of crocodile tears and puts you on its cover, chained. You look exceedingly alone, as alone, say, as the Jewish housewife in the boxcar headed for Dachau, or any one of our ancestors chained together in the name of Jesus headed for a Christian land." End quote. James saw this isolation, her isolation, the kinds of isolation that the prison industrial complex is predicated on. Right? You isolate people from their communities as a way to punish the soul, as Foucault describes in 1977's Discipline and Punish. Baldwin writes to Angela Davis across a great distance and a generational divide and offers this letter to her, an, an activist love letter. And in fact, it, it inspired a project I've been doing for about five years called Activist Love Letters and the ensuing Activist Portrait Series, but I'll tell you more about those projects later and in my session at the AGO tomorrow. I am an activist. I am a core team member of Black Lives Matter, Toronto, and as such, I'm enmeshed within a movement for black lives. As a result, I spend an inordinate amount of time poring over cases of anti-blackness, and in particular, police violence directed towards black, mad, and disabled people. I have rallied, I have protested, I have hosted discussions, created art, and lectured about the movement for black lives and about the concept of our lives mattering, that black lives matter. Similarly to Baldwin, I also would have thought that the repeated sight of maimed and far too often of dead flesh would be enough for all of us to get behind this phrase, black lives matter that seeing body after body maimed or deceased would make us all want to run screaming on the top of our lungs that black people's living and existence mattered on this planet. Because black people deserve to live. Black people deserve to thrive. Black people's lives matter. It matters that there are currently an open season on black bodies and an attempted genocide of our people through state-sanctioned white supremacy at the highest levels of decision-making and ranking. And yet still, people have a hard time embracing this loving concept, this idea that should be the least radical thing that we could utter. Black lives matter. Thank you. But instead, instead we're faced with this need for explanation, for softening, for diluting of our messaging. In the name of unspoken white supremacy, we are faced with the call for all lives matter. As if Kimberly Crenshaw hadn't written in 1991 about intersectionality, about how when we make space safer for those who are most marginalized, it makes space safer for everyone. And so black lives matter. As if the Combahee River Collective hadn't said in 1973 that making the world a better place for black women necessarily meant making a better place for all other pe beings on this planet. And so black lives matter. Instead, we're confronted by those who do not know or do not understand these important genealogies of resistance. And we have to justify, no, we have to clarify how much and in what context our lives matter, how much and in what context it matters if we live. This is a world that is not centered around the theme for this section, loving and living. But I choose to move, to roll with my people over to another place, wherein loving and living is central to our organizing, wherein all black lives mattered. And how do I do this? How do we get to this place of loving and living? We get there to this magical place every single time we get to connect with our people. 
We sit outside on apartment stoops and we tell stories. We text each other endlessly about our days. We laugh until our bellies hurt, both during and after our meetings, our nightly meetings for this rally or for that demo, stretching into the night long after we have put our kids to bed and worked a full day's work. And we eat together and we share this love with each other and we fall in love again and again and again with each other and we fall in love with the idea of loving and with our movements. Because we believe, as Che Guevara told us, and I quote, at the risk of seeming ridiculous, let me say that the true evolutionary is guided by a great feeling of love. It is impossible to think of a genuine revolutionary lacking this quality, end quote. Our revolution, our homelands and revolutions, must be rooted in love. We are in a time of profound love, and in a significant way, this is the counterbalance to hatred. And yes, it's true that we have seen a wicked rise in hatred. But like polar magnetic opposites, like handheld magnets pulling on iron filings, drawing the filaments closer and closer to the magnet, but never quite touching, this love is on the rise as well pushing and pulling against hatred and violence. Our movements are rooted in a profound love. Through my work with Black Lives Matter Toronto, I have witnessed a profound and radical love blossoming out of shared knowledge, self-determination, community accountability, and care. And I've fallen in love. I've fallen in love with our work and with our movement, and it's a deeper love every day, like, you know that house music song? I found a deeper love inside, right? <laughs> So when we camped outside overnight for 15 days in the coldest month of the year during the tent city occupation of March 2016, which was in honor of the death of our brother Andrew Loku, who was killed by the police for being black and mad, I felt overwhelmed by love. When we set up a press conference in the middle of the intersection at Young and Dundas last summer in memory of the Abdi Rahman Abdi, who was killed by the police for being black and disabled, and at Young and Bloor last week when we set up a press conference in solidarity with Beverly Bram, a black woman being threatened with deportation despite her two-month-old child and her husband both being Canadian citizens, we felt love. When we rushed into the intersection during the all-way crossing and rat -a tat tat set up a table and chairs and held a press conference in the middle of the street, I felt full of life and I felt full of love. When we dropped rainbow-colored smoke bombs during the 2016 Pride Parade and held an audience of millions as we called <clears throat> for an end to anti-blackness within Toronto's LGBTTI2QQA communities and within the Pride Toronto organization. Our love reverberated throughout this entire country, inspiring countless response actions and calling for the banning of police from Pride Parades nationally. And when we gathered our babies together this summer, for the second annual three-week-long Freedom School, and we watched our children reciting the names of black revolutionaries, creating their own safety plans rooted in community accountability and not the prison system, and singing together Debbie Young's anthem, Black Lives Matter, and James Brown's I'm Black and I'm Proud, we all felt the love of every single generation flowing backwards and forwards throughout time and bathing us. These were our love letters our activist love letters that helped us move beyond a place where the sight of black flesh destroyed was not to return to Baldwin's letter to Angela Davis, as one might have hoped, so intolerable a sight for the American people and so unbearably, um, unbearable a memory that they would themselves spontaneously rise up, end quote, perhaps becoming human shields for our black, disabled, deaf, and mad bodies. We wrote these love letters in every meeting, in every action, and in every moment where we stopped to think of another person and to reach out across distance and difference. And these love letters carried us through. In Black Lives Matter Toronto, we are a group of queer and trans and allied people who fight daily around disability justice, trans rights. We confront anti-blackness and we survive because of each other, because we are living and loving while building a movement around us. And it is beautiful. The speakers today all help us to understand loving and living in this moment of indigenous resurgence, of Black Lives Mattering, of disability justice activism and gender advocacy, and working for justice for migrant people. They help us through their creative interactions and through the ways that they live their lives. It is a great honor to be amongst these brilliant thinkers, makers, and organizers, both presenters. I'm going to spill water all over the stage for the ancestors. <laughs> Ashay, intentional. 
<laughs> so it is a great honor to be amongst all of these brilliant thinkers, makers, and organizers, both presenters and you in the audience. I love your work, and I offer my reflections today as part of a love letter to each of you, as a thank you for working in this world to make it a place where we can witness the enormous revolutionary in consciousness that Baldwin describes at the end of his letter. He says, this enormous revolution in black consciousness which has occurred in our generation means the beginning or the end of life in America. And each of you here are fighting for the beginning or the end of what we know as regular life on the north part of Turtle Island through, colonial, through a colonial lens. And each of you help us to want to fight for the lives of black and indigenous people as though we were fighting for our own lives, knowing that when we reach the end of this journey, this place of winning that Asada Shakur describes, she says, and this is what our little freedom school fighters memorized, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. And through our work, we have done just that. We've begun to lose our chains. So thank you for loving and protecting each other as we love and live together through this moment of great homelands and revolutions. Thank you. Cyrus, for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned uh, the house song, uh, Deeper Love, and when you quoted the James Baldwin letter to Angela Davis, which began with Dear Sister, those words, Dear Sister, I really connected with that idea of uh, deeper love. Um, uh, James Baldwin also spoke about crocodile tears, mm -hmm. and you mentioned about uh, the pressure to kind of soften or dilute the message. Mm -hmm. And I often think that love is such a kind of uh, beleaguered concept, mm -hmm. um, but a necessary mm -hmm. concept. Um, how do you deal with these expressions of, of love uh, which avoid the tendency to dilute the message or like soften it, right? Yeah, I think, I think what Shay was saying when he, when he describes that, I mean, he necessarily is talking about revolutionary love. He talks about how love is rooted in direct action. So, I mean, like most of our great thinkers, we often synthesize these small quotes out of much larger discussions, you know, which is also a way of softening, right? Mm -hmm. we, we think that Martin Luther King had a dream, not that he was also working on the Poor People's Campaign and calling for an end to white supremacy in America. Mm -hmm. We just sort of soften it to the, to the a synthesizable moment. So what Che was sort of describing was that we absolutely needed to, by any means necessary, um, act uh, in a revolutionary way to change the world, but that love was the way to do that. So he talks about a love that is um, sometimes violent. He talks about a love that is expansive. And he talks about a love that, that sort of helps us to, to build and create um, a new future, like an, I guess, what we would now think of as an Afro future. Mm. Um, um, so in that way, it, it's not a co-opted neoliberal, let's all get along, love each other kind of message. It's saying, this is the only way that we are gonna survive. I mean, Asada says that too, the only way to survive with any human dignity at the moment on this planet is to struggle. And she's also talking about love, love and struggle as being two sides of a whole. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Cyrus. Thank you. Thank you.